Hey, Frank, uh, I just shared my slide deck and I think I might have knocked the video out. No sound.
Good afternoon. My name is Andrea Watson and I'm TVWD's communication and public affairs supervisor. It's my Andrea, you're muted. <sighs> Gets me every time. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon. My name is Andrea Watson and I'm TVWD's communication and public affairs supervisor. We're so pleased to have you join us today for Talking Water on the 2021-2022 rate proposal. In the past, we have hosted these rate open houses in person here at our office. And we just wanted to say we know the virtual meeting allows us to have some interaction with you and we welcome your questions and participation in this, but we miss the days of being able to look you in the eye and have a richer exchange of information. So we hope that we will get back to in-person events soon. Today, the forum will be discussing the water rates and charges. Many of our customers are billed jointly with Clean Water Services, which is a separate public agency who provides storm and wastewater management. They set their own rates independently from Tualatin Valley Water, and we are uh, providing you with your drinking water and for fire protection services. And so that is the um, frame. If you have questions about your sewer service, um, we won't really be able to do much more for you today other than refer you to clean water services. Next slide, please. Before we get started today, we did want to go over some of the logistics and um, show you where you can type in your questions because we are going to start the session today with some presentation. There's a lot of great information in there, a lot of details. So if you uh, use that dialog box there with the question mark inside of it, you could type your questions in there. What we do with that is we are reviewing those. We're finding one of our subject matter experts that's on the call today that will answer your question at the question and answer period at the end. And we um, just want to remind you that as a public agency, your comments do become part of the public record. And these sessions are recorded so that customers who aren't able to attend in this time slot can receive the information uh, by watching the replay. We also wanted to remind you that we do operate in an inclusive and discrimination uh, free manner. We've done a lot of these events and we've never had a disruption or a problem, but um, we know people can get pretty wound up about their water bill and that's why we want to talk to you about it. But we do ask that you uh, keep your questions, you know, free of like personal attacks or any kind of profanity. If, that, if that's contained in there, then we won't uh, be able to publish those for you today. Um, we will have staff there again reading it, and so they'll um, possibly retype your question with the content without those comments, but we just wanted to alert you to that. We also wanted to um, remind you that we are hosting three of these events. So if you have neighbors or friends or family that you tell about this and they're interested, there are additional opportunities to participate. It's exactly the same content. We just repeat that so customers who have different schedules have the opportunity to participate at a convenient time. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned today, um, we are going to start the session out as we always do with some information um, through presentation. And we have three speakers today. We have our chief executive officer, Tom Hickman. We have our Willamette Water Supply Program Director, Dave Kraska. And those two gentlemen are professional engineers. That's what the PE behind their name stands for in case uh, you're new to our events you might not have heard that before and then also joining us is our chief financial officer Paul Matthews next slide okay it looks like I'm handing it over to you Tom and Tom Hickman chief executive officer thank you Andrea and uh, appreciate those taking the time to attend this today uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we have uh, two of our board members that I can see in attendance with us. Um, we have our uh, president, uh, Commissioner Todd Sanders, and uh, our commissioner, Jim Doan. So they are, are here to hear this as well and hear any questions you may have. Um, so today's information is, is all focused on the proposed rate increases. Uh, this is something we want to make sure we're being completely transparent and open about and explain what's driving those rate increases. Uh, the Board of Commissioners will be 
ultimately uh, collecting input and in advance of adopting uh, the water rates for the next two years. And that's part of the purpose of this is that they can hear from you. The water rate you pay can only be used to fund the operation, management, maintenance, and construction of your water system. And uh, I think it's important to point out that our funding uh, comes only from rates. We receive no uh, funding from any tax, tax sources. Uh, to help you understand the purpose of the proposed rate, we, uh, as Andrea mentioned, I, I have our chief financial officer joining us today, Paul Matthews, and uh, I also have Dave Kraska, who is our uh, manager for the Willamette Water Supply. And uh, and I, I Dave's main role is to explain uh, how we are um, spending and controlling costs on that project since it is the main driver uh, of the rates over the next two years. But we will also be explaining what we've done to uh, contain rate increases um, and also uh, make them uh, more um, predictable in the future. Next slide. So um, our, our system uh, faces uh, some risks uh, that threaten our water supply. Uh, certainly, uh, most everyone's aware of the fact that we um, are, are in the area that could be impacted by uh, the Cascadia subduction uh, event. Uh, and we're gonna talk about the investments we're making to offset these risks. Uh, in addition to earthquake, um, we're seeing droughts and we're seeing them on an increasing frequency um, as a result of climate change. So we're also making investments to address that risk uh, of, of future droughts and more long-term droughts. And then of course, um, power outages and fires also propose uh, a risk for uh, our water supplies. So these are all things that we're making investments in uh, with your rate payer dollars to minimize um, that uh, potential disruption as a result of those. Next slide. So uh, to, to minimize those risks, um, we have multiple systems, uh, uh, multiple uh, sources of water that we can access. Uh, the one you're going to be hearing a lot about today is the Willamette water supply um, and uh, from the Willamette River. And uh, that is the, the newest source that we're working on. But it's important to acknowledge that that uh, work actually began uh, probably 40 years ago. And in, in the 70s uh, is when we acquired the water rights uh, for that supply. Uh, since then, a lot of studies, a lot of work has been done uh, over the years, and you're going to hear in a bit um, all the work that we did to analyze this uh, as a source compared to other sources, and ultimately uh, why we decided to go with this source uh, as a supply to, to minimize those risks I mentioned. In addition to uh, the Willamette supply, we have reservoirs. Um, that can help us, uh, you know, offset um, those peak needs and, and really help us meet our demands during those peak times. And then we have uh, aquifer storage and recovery. This is where we actually take water when uh, high flows are available and we, we take that water and we put it into the ground to make it available to us when um, water supplies are more limited. And then we have regional partnerships uh, with the Joint Water Commission uh, and with the Portland Water Bureau. Uh, these are other; these are two additional sources of supply that we we have and utilize today, uh, and are uh, dependent on today. And then, of course, um, we have water conservation, and water conservation plays a critical role in being able to meet our future demands with our existing supplies. Next slide. So how do we use your money? Uh, so the, the, what you're gonna hear today is um, right now, the, the current dollars uh, are almost largely um, 
aimed at this construction of an additional water supply uh, from the Willamette. It, it, it's a huge capital investment that's been long in the making and we're now at a point uh, that we're, we're, we're entering the peak phases of construction. I'll talk more about that here in a moment. Um, but we also spend uh, the money on repairs and replacements of aging infrastructure. So um, this infrastructure doesn't last forever uh, and we have to replace pipes and pumps. And um, in order to do that, we, we use your rates to, to offset those costs. Um, and then of course, uh, we use the money to purchase water um, from both the Portland Water Bureau and the Joint Water Commission. Next slide. So uh, this slide is what is, it's a slide of what our investments are, the dollars that we will be spending here over the next uh, decade. And um, what you see there on the left hand side is uh, this rather large spike and this spike is being driven uh, by our investment in the Willamette water supply. Uh, in fact, there's an element within that gray area that's also part of uh, the Willamette supply uh, project as a whole. So. Uh, a huge portion uh, over the next two years are being driven by uh, this capital investment. This in turn is driving our rates. Um, this is what's making uh, the rates go up. And uh, as you know, um, probably many of you ex have experienced uh, what the cost of everyday items has happened over the last few years. Uh, the cost of concrete, the cost of steel, the cost of plastic, that all impacts us um, as we uh, embark on this project. And so we're trying to create a, a situation that we can actually um, plan for those uh, future increases um, while stabilizing rates into the future. Uh, next slide. Slide, I think, not slide. <laughs> Um, so uh, what have we done to manage uh, costs for the district? Um, well, one that we've done is um, I, I've asked the team to uh, take a look at their budgets and ask them to, you know, hey, we, we got to find places to, to cut and reduce. Um, we reduced our personal services budget by 2.8%. Uh, one of the things I, I like to point out is the fact that we, we are a very lean organization in terms of staffing. We don't have a lot of what you would call excess or uh, staffing. Um, we, we are very tight and lean in terms of our staffing. And, uh, you know, that cut uh, or reduction is certainly felt by all of us here in terms of additional workload. Um, and we are very busy with, with a great deal of work. Uh, in addition, we've deferred uh, $50 million of infrastructure projects. Now, these, this was uh, a long discussion and very difficult decisions that had to be made not only by uh, us and our board as uh, Tualatin Valley Water District, but this was also uh, had to be made, the same decisions had to be made by our partners, um, Hillsboro and Beaverton, in terms of agreeing to these, these reductions and cuts uh, in the project. Uh, but we felt it was necessary uh, to make uh, these decisions in order to minimize uh, rate impacts to all of our customers. And then the other thing we've done is we've partnered with other utilities to keep our costs low. That we do this when we when we partner with these other utilities, we get to spread these costs out over a larger population and and help keep these costs down. So we're taking a lot of actions uh, trying to keep uh, your rates from going up, but. Um, as I said, rates uh, do need to go up in order to address the, the spending that we're going to be incurring over the next couple of years that I showed in the prior graph. Um, next slide, please. So what are the strategies we've used? So first, let me 
identify the the risks that that we presented to the board and um, we believe these are risks to our our, our financial um, well-being as a district and and that is um, there's significant risk that future rate increases could be higher than planned this was something we presented to the board and and believe that if we didn't take some really strong steps now we would be in a position that um, we could see even higher rate increases in the future. Um, the other risks that we presented were that um, uh, the economy uh, really impacted um, our water sales and uh, they haven't quite recovered to what our pre-COVID levels were. They're certainly better uh, than what they were in the prior two years, but um, we had a significant reduction in revenue uh, which really impacted the district uh, in terms of our, our financial capacity. And then uh, the, there's a significant construction risk that remains. Um, we're, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're doing this very large project. And um, while we take a lot of steps to contain costs, keep costs, um, you know, within the predicted range uh, that we thought for that project, and, and I will say our team has done a phenomenal job actually keeping the costs uh, fairly well contained to the early estimates of the project. Um, there's still risk, uh, yeah, as we've seen here in the last couple of years. Just some examples, uh, you know, a, a sheet of plywood went from, I think, somewhere around $20 a sheet uh, in over to, to over $100 a sheet. Um, uh, concrete, you know, went up significantly. Steel went up significantly. Um, these are all things that um, we use uh, in the construction and, and it impacts us and uh, it remains a significant risk. So what are we doing to address these risks and, and, and what's the, what has the board directed us to do uh, to, to try to address these risks? Well, uh, we want to build financial capacity. And uh, we do that by uh, adopting rates that provide financial resources in advance. So that's why we're here today. Uh, these, these higher rate increases now actually protect us in the future and stabilize us and make things more predictable for us in the future than if we did not take these actions. Um, they, the board also recognized that um, we have customers who are already struggling and, uh, you know, it's already a tough situation. And so they enhanced um, our customer emergency assistance program significantly. Uh, this allows us to help those that are struggling to pay their water bill. Uh, those that qualify, we actually can uh, offer them uh, some uh, relief in, in what it's what what these rates uh, uh, do to them and how it impacts them. And then the the last thing we're doing and being very aggressive about is pursuing federal and state assistance. So um, we are looking for uh, funding from a number of sources. Uh, and most of you may have heard uh, in the last 24 hours or so here, um, uh, Congress has passed a very large infrastructure bill. Uh, so this all presents a new opportunity for us to get some funding potentially in addition to the WIFIA loans uh, that we've already received, uh, which provides us uh, money at a very low interest rate. So uh, we continue to monitor both uh, federal and state uh, financial capacity to to help us make these investments that we need to make. Uh, next slide. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce Dave Kraska. Uh, he is our Willamette Water Supply Program Director, and uh, Dave is going to explain what we're doing on that project and what he's doing to contain costs on that project. Dave. Great, thank you very much, uh, Tom. So let's continue on, get into it with the next slide. So as Tom mentioned, I've got four parts to my presentation. Uh, the first part is a brief uh, explanation about uh, TVWD's search for a long-term water supply and kind of how we got started on this, on this path that we're on. And then I'll provide you an explanation with uh, what 
is the Willamette Water Supply Program, provide you an overview of that. Um, I'll explain our delivery progress to date since we've been uh, operating the program and then looking ahead, what we anticipate or plan to do in, in the next fiscal year and the years to come. Next slide. So uh, regarding the long-term water supply selection, uh, this is something that TVWD has been working on for frankly for decades, uh, beginning back in the 70s when TVWD acquired rights to the Willamette River for the reasons that the, that the folks that ran the district back then have. Uh, and then since that time, since the 70s, uh, the TVWD regularly evaluated its long-term water supplies. And then finally in 2011, uh, commissioned a detailed study of the full four options that are shown on the right hand graphic in the slide here. Uh, starting from the top, uh, one of the options was constructing a groundwater supply to the north and continuing on in a clockwise fashion. The uh, second option was, was purchasing additional water from the city of Portland. Down there in the bottom is the mid Willamette supply. And then finally increased storage at Hag Lake, which would increase supply from the Joint Water Commission and existing source for TVWD. Uh, through this technical study that included pub public input, input that it concluded with a board decision in 2013, the Mid Willamette River supply was selected as the long term supply for the reasons stated here. Um, of the options considered, it was the lower cost. And then from that, um, it the less impact on rates. Um, it provides excellent water quality, as proven by about 20 years of operation um, in, for the city of Wilsonville and Sherwood that have been taking water over that period of time. Uh, it provides ownership uh, opportunity where TVW would own its water supply, where currently uh, all the water purchased from Portland is, is a, a TVW is not in an ownership position, so that provides operational and financial benefits for the district. It's a reliable supply and it also encumbers fewer environmental impacts when compared to the other alternatives that were considered. So that's how the district came about to making this decision almost 10 years ago. And then from that time, the program was created to get the work done. So let's go to the next slide. And so let me provide you a pro, an overview of the Willamette Water Supply Program. Next slide. And this starts with the mission. So uh, the people that, that kicked off the program or kicked off the initiation of the program first crafted this mission that really guides everything that we do on the program. And it states, I'll just read it out loud here, to provide a cost effective, reliable and resilient water supply system by July 2026 that benefits the current and future generations of the communities we serve and supports a vibrant local economy. Um, key in there is, is conclusion and by uh, July 2026, so that provides a clear uh, deadline for us to complete our work. On the bottom of the slide, you see uh, not only TVWD, but also the cities of Hillsborough and Beaverton. So it's important to recognize that TVWD is not alone in getting this done. This is a regional project and the costs are shared amongst the program partners that include those two cities. Next slide. So we've, oh, and then as far as the, uh, the overview, that was the uh, program mission statement. So here's uh, uh, some slides to explain to you what the program is. And, and I've got a little bit of a different uh, abbreviation here, WWSS. So that abbreviation is for the Willamette Water Supply System. So this is the system that the program is implementing. Begins in the south of the Willamette River intake located in Wilsonville. So this is an existing intake on the Willamette River that we're um, expanding and increasing its seismic resiliency. We're constructing a new state-of-the-art water treatment plant that's going to be located on the eastern end of Sherwood. More than 30 miles of large diameter transmission pipeline connecting everything to the uh, to the distribution systems and then finally water storage tanks on the top of Cooper Mountain. Next slide. So I've got some photos here to to kind of bring home what those elements actually look like. Uh, so if you've ever been down to the Willamette River water treatment plant or the part right the part right next to it in Wilsonville, you'll uh, this may look familiar to you, this aerial shot of that park. I'll go ahead and click again. You'll see a flag arrive, and that shows where the uh, Royal Rada pump station is at the intake. Let's go ahead and click again, see an aerial view of this. So this is an aerial view of the water treatment plant, kind of in the in the left center or right center of the photo, the treatment, the park right below it, Willamette River uh, to the right. Right uh, to, to the top, you see kind of the, it looks like a construction zone, but that's actually Wilsonville Concrete Products. That's their operational facilities there. Go ahead and click again. 
The dashed line in there indicates where the Willamette intake facilities are. So underneath the water there is our fish screen where we draw water in through a pipe that's below the bank there, brings the water over to that square, the square box there that is the Royal Water Pump Station. And then from there we'll be pumping water uh, to our water treatment plant that will be located in Sherwood. So let's go ahead and click to the next slide. So there's a lot going on on this slide. Let me explain. The, uh, the photo on the left hand side is a photo of the existing Willamette River water treatment plant. And the reason that's important to us is that plant's been in operation for about 20 years and the operation has been successful. And so we're modeling a lot of what we do, uh, building off the success of that treatment plant, uh, but also incorporating technological advances that have occurred over the last two decades. So on the right hand, Hand side on the upper drawing there, you see our engineering plan for the whole uh, water treatment plant that we will be constructing, as I mentioned, east of Sherwood, right up against the brand new uh, 124th Avenue, uh, Avenue Road that goes right through there. And so there's a lot going on there. We anticipate beginning construction in about a year. The table there below um, indicates what I mean when I say at the bottom here, it says a multi-barrier water treatment plant to clean, the, to, to clean the river. What I mean by that, and in this table you see on the left-hand side, there are the constituents. So these are various things that might be in the raw water, turbidity and particles, uh, pathogens, taste and odor compounds, trace organics, or emerging contaminants. Across the top there are the different processes that are employed in, the, in our proposed plant ballasted flocculation, intermediate ozone, GAC filtration, UV disinfection and chlorine disinfection. And so going across there, you see for every constituent, we have more than one barrier uh, to re remove and reduce the, the concentrations of those constituents. So this is a very important and robust uh, means of protecting public health uh, through our processes. Next slide. So connecting our raw water pump pump station and our water treatment plant to the distribution systems is more than 30 miles of large diameter transmission mains. And this is uh, this photo here is of our pipeline installation uh, in, in a project in Wilsonville. This was actually pretty con constructed pretty early in the program. This is construction back in 2016. Next slide. And then finally, our, our storage tanks uh, planned on the top of Cooper Mountain. This is actually a photo of the Joint Water Commission's storage tanks. These are two 20 million gallon concrete storage tanks. Ours will be very similar in construction, but a little bit smaller. Ours will be two 15 million gallon tanks, but we are only planning on constructing one of those in the initial, uh, initial construction, and I'll explain why a little later in my presentation. Next slide. So talked about what we're uh, what the system is. So let me explain what we've done since 2015 when we began uh, work on the program. So we've been in operation on the program about six years and go ahead, click to the next slide. So progress to date, we've completed construction of six pipeline projects. Uh, we've secured with you loans. You heard Tom talk about that a little bit. Paul will be talking more about that to come. Uh, we've received our federal permit for all of our construction. We've advanced a design of 14 projects. We're advancing seven additional construction projects right now, and we've continued our successful partnerships. As I mentioned, these are partnerships with the cities of, of uh, Beaverton and Hillsborough, but we also have other partnerships going on throughout the program, including with the cities of Wilsonville, uh, Washington County, and others. Next slide. So talking a little bit of, uh, about of our progress to date, here is construction right at the raw water facility. You, you see on the left hand side, jet grouting on the right hand side, deep soil mixing. What's going on here is we had a we had an extensive project here to stabilize the bank of the Willamette River. What that does for us, it's very important, is that in the event of a major seismic uh, occasion, such as a Cascadia subduction zone event, the bank of the Willamette River is likely to shift towards the river and would likely move our raw water pump station with it, which would render it inoperable. So it's very important for us to shore up this single point of draw from the Willamette River so that it would be seismically resilient, which is a key element of our, of our mission, really. Next slide. Also there at the raw water facility, we have this upper site location <clears throat> where we're going to be locating all of our electrical facilities, our standby power facilities, surge control, and other operational elements related to the raw water pump station and uh, those facilities. 
So a lot of construction going on there. Next slide. As well, we're also constructing our pipeline. Construction of pipelines, especially of this size and length in, in Oregon, means crossing a lot of waterways. This one is right here at the raw water pump station where we had to cross Arrowhead Creek. In this particular situation, we, we went trenchless. Go ahead and open up all the flags there, Paul. Uh, so the sending shaft is on the left, receiving shaft is on the right, between them 270 feet of distance that we needed to cover. And so what this technology is, is a pipe ram equipment that basically hammers the pipe underground, underneath the, the, uh, the creek to the receiving shaft. And you see the 84 inch casing there staged off to the side. So this was the, this was uh, frankly the most economical way and environmentally sensitive way for crossing this particular uh, creek. Next slide. In some situations, however, open trench is the right solution, both again for environmental and economic standpoints. And this is how we crossed Coffee Lake Creek, which is right near uh, the crossing of Arrowhead Creek. It's just a few hundred feet away. Uh, but in this particular situation, you can see we shored on either side. Our pipeline there is going top to bottom. Coffee Lake Creek is going left to right. Actually, it's flowing right to left, to be perfectly honest. And you can see we've dammed up on either side and we have a pipe that carries the water across our trench. And so when we're done with uh, our construction, we have our pipeline installed. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Obviously, re restoration and mitigation is a, is a key element of, of making it look like we were never even there. And so this is what that site looks like today um, as part of our part of our work to basically clean up after ourselves and leave it actually in better condition than before we got there. Next slide. Uh, we're also installing a lot of pipeline in other locations. This shows our transmission pipeline installation right next to Tile Flat Road. Uh, perhaps you uh, drove through that area. A lot of work in the South Beaverton area to get our pipelines installed in advance of the development work that's occurring there. Uh, we have a lot of had a lot of pipeline installation work going on on Tile Flat Road, Shoals Ferry Road, and, and Roy Rogers Road. The Roy Rogers Road work was actually done in concert or in partnership with Washington County. As they were widening the road there, we were installing our pipeline to get that project done together. Next slide. Sometimes we also work at night. And so this is a, where a, a situation where we had to cross 209th Avenue right near Farmington. And the, the best way for us to do that is to get it done at night and get out of there and get out of the way so that we impacted traffic as little as possible. Worked with Washington County so that we could close that road. Um, I think we started on a Friday night and by Saturday night we had the road back open back up. So we actually got it done ahead, a day ahead of time. Next slide. So that was a really quick run through of some of the work that's been going on over the last six years. Uh, one of the really nice things about it is that uh, we're, the, the money is being kept local. 94% of the spend to date, uh, $215 million as of the end of 2020, uh, went to local businesses. Uh, that's 313 businesses in the area. What do I mean by local businesses? We characterize that as any business within 50 miles of all of our work. And so that, that it accounts for a lot of counties in the area. And it's uh, it's it's been, been, been great for the local economy, quite frankly. Uh, we're also tracking the rest of the spend that goes to regional uh, businesses. Those are uh, businesses outside of the 50 miles, but still in Oregon or Washington or outside of Oregon and Washington. But anyway, so this is this is something that we track on a regular basis and we're glad to date that it's so far been at such a high level as the money has been kept local. Next slide. So looking ahead, what do we have planned for the next fiscal year and the years beyond? Go ahead. Quite a bit, quite frankly. On the uh, on the right hand side of this graphic here, you see our our uh, Gantt chart. That's our that's basically uh, all the work that we that we plan to accomplish. All the projects there are on the on the left hand side of this graphic. Uh, the red shaded area is all of the work that we're going to get done in the next fiscal year, and that includes progressing design on seven projects, advancing sixteen construction projects. As you heard Tom mention, this is really getting into the heavy construction period for us. A lot of work in program management that includes WIFIA compliance or safety program, communications and outreach and development of financial procedures, continued acquisitions, including real estate permits, land use and procurement, and then finally continued planning activities, including our water supply integration efforts to plan for the future day when we will be integrating this new supply into the existing distribution systems, commissioning and startup of the whole system and our future operations planning. Next slide. So in getting 
Getting all of that done, how do we go about maintaining, or managing costs and staying on budget? There are six key ways that we've done that from the very beginning of the program. Starts with maximizing competition, and we've done this in every phase, whether it's hiring consultants, hiring advisors, or hiring contractors. And regarding the contractors in particular, and also with the design consultants, one of the things we did from the beginning is take all the, 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 full, the full extent of the program from the Willamette River up to the Sunset Highway and broke it out into projects that were specifically sized so that the larger local contractors could bid on them. They had the bonding capacity to do so, but they were also big enough to encourage national uh, competition um, into the area. Uh, basically, we thought, we feel, and we continue to believe that that is the best way for us to control costs and make sure that we're paying fairly uh, for all the work that's being done on the program. Finally, um, our, our next, once we've uh, selected a contractor or a consultant, we negotiate the best price. We negotiate pretty hard um, for, to, for the best price and quality of the services and goods being, being provided. Uh, then throughout the design process and also in the construction, we make sure that we're making cost effective engineering and design decisions in this hobby. This uh, goes through a value engineering process in every step of the way. A proactively managing risks early, anticipating risks at, that, that uh, come up, making sure that we're planning for them and mitigating them where necessary and assigning those mitigation measures is also very important in controlling our costs. A partner in pro on projects, as I mentioned, making sure that it's not just TVWD in this, but this is a regional effort and we have, a, we have other folks helping to pay the price. And then finally, rigorously managing all aspects of the program to stay on schedule. Uh, nothing hurts a budget worse than losing control of the schedule. And as I mentioned in our mission statement, we have a clear end date of, of, uh, of the summer of 2026, and we're going to hit that, and that's gonna help us stay on budget uh, better than anything else, quite frankly. Next slide. Partnerships save money and reduce impacts. Go ahead, one more click there, Paul. Uh, so as I mentioned before, TVW Hillsborough and Beaverton are program partners. So that's a key element of how we're partnering on all of this. But as well, we're doing work outside of those service areas. So uh, this is some early examples of the partnering uh, partnership projects that, that occur, have occurred on the program. Kinsman Project, where is a partnership with the city of Wilsonville and, and ODOT. The middle project there, 124th Avenue. That's a road project that Washington County had. Our pipeline was gonna be in the same location. So we aligned our design work and our, our construction work with them. So it was one project, saved us both quite a bit of money. And then finally, the South Hills area pipeline project. That time we coordinated with a developer in the area and we've done other developer coordination projects. And we've done other projects in, uh, in concert with, uh, with Wilsonville and with Washington County uh, because it makes sense from a cost standpoint and it also reduces impacts on the public. Next slide. So uh, last year was a weird year, um, as everyone knows. And uh, this is a, a graphic that shows our annual budget preparation review starts in December, ends in April. Um, and it starts with the program developing initial draft. And, and what it does is every single year on the program, we, we do a, a, a deep analysis of where we're at on our budget and are we still on track. And so we prepare our budget for the next fiscal year, distribute that to the to the uh, system uh, committees for review, um, and then we re, then we address those comments. Go ahead and click one more time, Paul. This year was a little bit tougher though, because there were the financial impacts related to COVID and the decreased water sales and so on. We had to do a lot of heavy lifting in, in order to really make sure that we were addressing the concerns and constraints um, experienced being by our funding partners. And so, as noted in this bullet here, revenues suffered from pandemic related challenges. Uh, the cost on the program had gone up a bit since the prior baseline. And so the other thing that we acknowledged in this particular year is that within a year, all the design efforts will be done and we will be in the full construction mode. So this is really our last opportunity to make any significant changes. And with that, with all the construction to come, substantial risk of cost escalation remains. So we wanted to put ourselves in as best position as possible to control all of that to bring the budget that could be approved by the management committee, <clears throat> of which Tom is one of the members, and then ultimately by the uh, WWSS board in April. Next slide. So the changes that we made, go ahead and open up this whole slide, Paul, please. 
is uh, we evaluated options for reducing the spend through 2026 of between 30 million and 170 million, basically to, to give the decision makers as many opportunities as possible. But with that come consequences. And so, and so the decision makers had to balance the mission of the WWSP with the current realities and the financial situation. Ultimately, an evalu the eva through the evaluation of the options, the management committee selected uh, reducing spending by about $50 million. So it's a meaningful reduction. And we did that by uh, deferring one reservoir. So instead of building the two reservoirs at the top for Cooper Mountain, we'll build one now, defer one to the future. Our pipeline project PLW 2.0, that's a, a pipeline project in Cornelius Pass Road from Francis all the way up to the Sunset Highway. We're gonna be deferring most of that project to a future. We can get into operation and meet most most of our needs uh, without that pipeline for the near term. And so, so most of that pipeline is going to be deferred for the future. And there were some other minor deferrals, including the uh, fiber optic system, other treatment plant components and some staff positions. So through all of that, we're able to reduce our spend uh, through 2026 by 50 million, which was a, a meaningful, uh, meaningful reduction that should help with the rates. I think that's my last slide. I think I passed the presentation on to Paul now. So thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I'm Paul Matthews, uh, the district's chief financial officer, and one of my responsibilities is to tie the finances of this program together with the work that uh, Dave just described. Uh, but before I get into those details, I, I want to thank people for attending this open house, uh, virtual open house. Uh, we know that you're busy, that you have things to do during the middle of the week, and that's an important uh, part of the public process for you to participate, and I just want to take an opportunity to say thank you. So the district operates within a uh, financial management process, as we like to describe. There are three phases to this. The first is the development of the financial plan. Now, Tom talked about our financial strategies, and we start that early on with our strategic planning process, and then we develop uh, financial strategies, uh, present them, work closely with our board on, uh, on those priorities, and incorporate that into a financial plan, which is formally approved by the board, and that was approved in May of this year. Once we've completed the financial plan, uh, staff uses that information, the guidance contained within that, to develop the budget. We are budgeted on a biennial basis, which means that we adopt a two-year budget uh, at any given uh, budget period. So this year was our budget period, and from July 1 of 2021 uh, through June 30 of 2023, we've adopted that budget. A budget is a two-year spending plan. It is uh, It incorporates the strategic initiatives uh, that are incorporated in the financial plan what is that two-year spending plan. Once we have the financial plan and the budget complete, then we develop the rates that support that. And that's what we're doing here today to describe that. And then of course, the district delivers on all the other priorities and delivering the water and the construction projects uh, that we've talked about earlier. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the district's financial forms, the most recent biennium as a context to how we developed our financial strategy, financial plan, budget, and rates. Uh, so first, I want to talk about our operating expenditures. Uh, COVID-19 did hit us, and it hit us hard, and we took actions, uh, CEO and others, direct us to reduce our spending uh, to create more financial flexibility during these COVID times. And so uh, although we've ended, our, we've ended our fiscal year on June 30, uh, we still have invoices coming in for vendors that will be scored against prior year. So right now we're estimating that uh, our savings uh, will be uh, a little bit over $10 million, meaning that we've lowered our operating expenditures during the budget period to create that financial flexibility. That's good news. Uh, on the capital side, similarly, our capital expenditure savings have uh, been significant during this period of time as well. And that has provided us more flexibility uh, on the cash flow side as well. But on the not so good news side is our water sales. We were affected by COVID-19 just like most businesses were. And uh, we've seen a reduction in water sales. Again, uh, the total amount of that reduction will be known in the coming months as we read meters, make final adjustments. But we're assuming that we're gonna be about 10 to $12 million below plan on the, uh, on the water sales revenue, which affects our ability to uh, leverage and use uh, debt. I'll talk more about that when I talk about our financial strategy. Oh, I do wanna point out another uh, positive though, which is our system development charges. And these are charges that are allowed under Oregon law that 
or for new development within the district. Uh, the idea behind this is that when a new development occurs, they pay for the cost of growth so that our existing customers aren't burdened by that cost. So we have had system development charges that have been uh, uh, slightly above plan during the, uh, during the planning period. Uh, if we look at our financial uh, performance and summary revenues, COVID-19 did negatively affect our water sales revenues. Uh, our system development charges I mentioned did exceed plan. On the expenditure side, management focused on saving to provide that financial flexibility I mentioned for COVID-19. So our operating expenditures were below budget. Uh, we had higher than anticipated bad debt expenses, though, as we dealt with uh, customers inability to pay and uh, our capital expenditures were uh, below below budget. From a cash perspective, our projected ending fund balances are actually higher than expected, largely because of the savings on capital expenditures during the biennium. Uh, also, we have $68 million of cash that will be accessible through our WIFI loan, which is the low interest loan we got from the EPA at a 1.35% interest rate uh, that will help us uh, fund the water, water supply system. So in conclusion, COVID-19 reduced the revenue affecting the district's financial performance, as well as our debt strategy. Uh, the savings have offset near-term losses in revenues, despite an increase in the bad debt expense that I had mentioned, and the district's cash position remains strong. I want to talk now about the financial plan and the proposed rates. You saw this slide uh, in Tom's presentation as we look at the district's capital expenditures over the next decade. Uh, the gray areas expenditures within the district, the blue area are expenditures within the water supply program, but you can see that we are in a very large investment cycle and will be there through about 2025-26 when we finally commission the uh, WWSS. Uh, we've been planning for this for quite some time. We've, we've, put, uh, we've uh, secured financing other other measures, but this is the large effort that we have. In total, if you look at the, the totals, about 510 million uh, for the water supply program, $400 million for in-district CIP. And that in-district CIP includes some renewal and replacement of, of assets, but a lot of that uh, is also to complete some of the conveyance projects we need within the district to move the water supply program water uh, to where it's needed. So in total over the next 10 years, about $918 million that we will be spending. Uh, we'll be managing an expenditure much more than that because we'll be managing the expenditures of our partners as well, but this will be what 12th Valley Water District is expected to spend. We will use long-term debt to fund some of these projects. These projects have lives that are decades. In some cases, we expect these assets to be in service for more than 100 years. Uh, so we use long-term debt to for multiple purposes. One is that it uh, reduces the immediate impact on rates, but it also allows those future users of the water system to pay their fair share of the capital improvement and keeps within the district's uh, cost of service policy. Uh, so we do have our WIFIA loan that uh, we already have secured. In addition to that, we're expecting to spend, uh, to borrow another $36 million in revenue bonds. I will say that number is very volatile depending on the assumptions within the financial plan, that number can go up and down uh, but we're looking at uh, somewhere about $424 million in borrowing over the next 10 years. You can see that borrowing is concentrated during the period of time of our high capital outlays, and we expect that um, we will not need uh, future borrowings um, uh, during the planning period that we show here, the 10-year period. With every forecast, there are risks, and this one is no different, and I've highlighted some of these risks here. Um, obviously, we do have large exposure to the purchase cost of water, from our uh, wholesale provider, City of Portland, as well as from the Joint Water Commission, where we're a partner. Uh, but we do have to look at the higher cost of water, and that would affect our financial plan. Another important one is interest rates. Uh, that can affect our cost of borrowing and uh, affect the, um, the financial plan in that regard. Capital expenditures, we're paying particular, particularly close attention to the inflation rate. Many of you have probably seen in the news, uh, we have seen an uptick in inflation. Uh, it's not clear yet if that's transitory nature or if it's going to be a long lasting effect. So we're watching that very carefully. Um, so that's an important part of looking at that uh, long term capital project, as well as the other items that we have listed here. I want to put out some of the other risks that we have. Uh, when we looked at the risk of the forecast a few years ago, we had listed potential for an economic downturn and potential for change in water demand. We didn't think that was coming from COVID-19. And obviously it was. So there are events like that that are outside our control. 
that we may see uh, in, in the future. So given the assumptions that we have and how we're going to fund and finance the well and water supply program or operating expenses, we proposed uh, rate increases. We have two sets of rates. We have volume rates that are based on the amount of water you consume. We have fixed charges. I'm going to talk about the volume rates first. Uh, our volume rates have two blocks, a block one, which is for lower consumption, a block two, which captures the peaking related costs, which are slightly higher. Uh, we're looking at a current increase of from $5.62 for the block one rate to $6.15 uh by november 1st of 2021 and then to 673 by november of 2022. Uh, the block two rate going from just above eight dollars to about uh, eight and three quarters dollars uh, this november and then nine dollars and sixty cents in november of 2022. so these blocks are based on the quantity of water you that you purchase uh, for single family residential customers the block one rate applies to the first 14 ccf per month or 28 ccf over a bi-monthly period that you purchase. Uh, for all the other classes, it's 140% of their average annual water uh, demand over a 12 month moving average. Uh, those factors uh, are designed to account for the difference in cost of meeting those peak season demands for our customers following district's cost of service. Now moving on to the fixed charges. Fixed charges recover the cost of maintaining the meter and service as well as billing uh, services and um, the cost, uh, some of the cost of fire protection. So even if you're not using water, we still provide fire protection throughout the district service area. The charges vary by meter size, and you can see the charges listed here for the various meter sizes. We look at the rates, and then we look at the impact that that has on typical customers. And the typical customer at TBWD consumes seven CCF of water, which is just under 5,000 gallons on a monthly basis. Um, the uh, typical impact is going from the typical customer monthly bill is going from about $56.33 to $61.65 uh, by November 1st of 2021 and then $67.48 in the next year. We have this presented graphically so you can see the same information uh, that was in the graph but uh, here in tabular form. It's an increase of $5.32 per month in this November and $5.83 per month in November of 2022. We did have a typographical error in the postcard, so if you're wondering what the difference is, that was that the postcard think had uh, 538 rather than 583. Those numbers were transposed. We look at not just the typical customer, we also look at the impact on an above average single family residential customer. Above average customer using 12 CCF, uh, which is about 9,000 gallons of water, or 37 tons of water, by the way, would see an increase of about $8 this November and about eight and three quarters dollars in November of 2022. And then we look at customers who have very high usage for single family. This is quite a bit of water that they would have, about 21,000 gallons per month or over 87 tons of water that we deliver. Uh, their bill uh, would be going up to just under $20 per month in November of 2021 and $21.51 November of 2022. I must emphasize this is a very large user with a lot of water, probably only a bill that somebody might get in the summer month. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom uh, to close, have his closing remarks. Thank you, Paul and Dave. Uh, I appreciate it. And I just want to thank all of you for attending, as Paul mentioned. Uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time to hear uh, what is behind our rates, what's driving those rates. Uh, but I also want to point out, while nobody likes their rates going up, um, and, and truly nobody, uh, one of the things that I, I think we have to keep in mind is that we are delivering this natural resource to your home uh, on a, on a non-demand basis, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, highest quality water, um, and and just uh, just a great um, resource, natural resource to you, and we're doing it for 1.2 cents per gallon. Uh, that's a phenomenal, uh, frankly, deal we all get. Uh, that we we get water delivered to our homes for such a phenomenal rate. Um, it, it doesn't mean uh, we can take that lightly. Uh, we take this very seriously. 
uh, and to keep those rates down as much as possible uh, while making strategic investments in the infrastructure to make sure we can maintain that high quality and reliable supply to your door. So uh, we want to thank you. And at this point, um, we certainly, if you have any questions, I encourage you to uh, please type your questions into the box. And I'm going to turn this over to Andrea and uh, let her moderate any questions that may be coming in. Excellent. Next slide, please. Um, just before we turn over the question and answers, I just want to remind those of you that may have joined after we explained how it works, you can type those into the thought bubble. It's up at the top of your screen and it looks like a little cartoon thought bubble with a question mark in it. Um, but we also just wanted to remind you that there are additional opportunities to um, provide your comments and your feedback to our board. Um, they will be accepting comments on the rate proposal through August 25th at 4 p.m. You can send a letter to our headquarters. You can email at board at tvwd.org. And then we also have set up an online form where you can type those comments um, into that form. Regardless of how you contact us about the proposal, we do compile all those comments and feedback forms, and we forward those on to each of our Board of Commissioners who carefully reviews that in advance of the public hearing. We also have two more opportunities to attend an information session. As we said at the opening, the content, the presentation portion will be the same, but we do want to engage with our customers. We wish it was in, per in person, but again, we just want to thank you for taking time today and we want to get all of the questions that our customers have answered. So there's an additional session this evening from 6 to 7.30 and then and the last and final session is on a Saturday morning, 9.30 to 11 a.m., and that's August 21st. And then the board will have a public hearing on August 18th. That's virtual. And if you do want to participate in that process, we need you to email Debbie Carper at tbwd.org. That information is on our website and was contained on the postcard that Paul mentioned that was mailed to your home or your service address. And then the final step in this part of the process is adopting the rates, and that will be on August 25th. Next slide, please. And this Actually, is again concludes that, the uh, present. Andrea, I'm sorry, correction oh. on the rate adoption. It'll be at the rate yes. in, um, in September. September 15th. September 15th is the date. So we'll get that corrected, but that is incorrect on the slide. Thank you, Paul. So if we can move forward on this, we'll turn it over to the questions and answers. We don't have a lot of questions so far, but we hope you'll type some in or you'll forward those in your comment form so we can uh, get you the answers. So it's your turn and uh, go ahead, uh, Justin, will you take over and uh, go over the questions we've received so far? Yep, thanks so much, Andrea. Uh, the first question we've received is going to be addressed by Pete Boone. Uh, Pete's our Water Operations Division Manager. And the question is, is your physical and computer security hardening being addressed too? Will any of the pr this price increase be used for the security infrastructure? What I'm thinking about for physical concerns, how to stop people from contaminating the water reservoirs for computer security, I'm thinking about these ransomware issues. So I'll turn it over to Pete to address the first question. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Um, so we we do take security very seriously at the district. Um, and while these rate increases aren't driven by um, uh, the spending that we that we do on security, uh, the, the water rates do fund both our operating budget as well as our capital improvement plan. And, and a lot of what you've heard about today, you know, from the Willamette water supply system, um, that's a that's a capital project. Um, but but uh, our rates and, and the the water bills that our customers pay do do obviously fund our operating costs as well. So um, I'll, I'll talk about the physical security and and uh, as well as the cyber security. And then I believe Dave Kraska will he, he can talk about some of the security features of the new water supply program. Um, so we do uh, we do invest in in the, the physical hardening of our water system to prevent um, in, any kind of nefarious acts, any any type of uh, contamination, uh, in, whether that's intentional or or passive. Um, so, so with our water storage, our reservoirs, um, we want to make sure those are secured, and, and we have a variety of systems in place to do that. 
um, and and uh, I, I won't go into a ton of ton of detail, but but do know that we take that very seriously, and we actually go through uh, a security audit, um, a, a water system survey that's um, uh, put on by the the Oregon Health Authority. So we do that every three years. They come out, um, they take a look at our, uh, our our security and and just the uh, the weather tightness of of storage and and different parts of the water system to to make sure that that we're doing a good job. So there are checks and balances in place there. Um, from the the cybersecurity aspect, um, obviously that's a that's a big concern. You hear about that a lot in the news lately with with the ransomware attacks. Um, so a couple different ways that that we we guard against that. Um, so one, we we have a computer system that. Um, provides automation and, and remote control of, of significant parts of the water system. We keep that uh, we keep that separated from uh, the internet um, so that that folks can't can't hack into that. We've got a, a, a number of measures in place to to keep that secure. Um, and from the business side, um, a, a different a different set of of measures in place. Uh, but having that having that gap between the two systems is is a big part of keeping the um, the cyber part of our water system uh, very secure. So again, yes, we invest heavily in that. Um, it doesn't it doesn't drive the rate increase um, and and uh, that's that's more part of our operating budget. We do uh, we do have a, a large capital improvement plan um, both in the current biennium and the next biennium. So in the next four years we'll be spending a little over two million two million dollars uh, upgrading our uh, our computer network that runs the water system. It's called SCADA. Um, so we, we do have some spending there and and I will uh, pass this over to uh, Dave Kraska if he wants to add anything about the Willamette. Well, thanks Pete and uh, and thank you for the question. I, I don't have anything to uh, to really to add to what Pete said. Um, I, I'm sure the, the person who posed the question understands that we can't get into any of the details on it. Um, one of the nice nice about our security measures and what we're doing, uh, but but one of the nice things about having this rare opportunity of creating a brand new water supply system is that you get to learn from everything that's that's happened before, uh, so we can apply the the latest and greatest uh, knowledge and technologies in terms of seismic design and water treatment and and uh, and physical and and uh, cyber security as well. So all of that's being taken very seriously to have a to have a really a first rate facility all the way around. Um, uh, the and, 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 and regarding the security on the on the WWSS, it's multi layered. Whether it's uh, whether it's phys physical or IT security. Um, the only thing that I'll add, uh, Tim Boylan, um, uh, TBW's IT manager, uh, has posted a question in the chat that is that is on point as well. And the only thing that I'll add to that on top of it is. When in regards to ransomware and things of that nature, a lot of it is employee training, um, and and TVW takes that very seriously as well as, as as training folks to be on guard for things like that and make sure that we don't fall prey to uh, such uh, situations. So that's all I had to add to that, that that question. Hopefully, we answered the question adequately. Thanks so much, Dave, and I'll read Tim's comment here for anyone who uh, isn't in the chat, but he wrote uh, TVWD invests in cybersecurity each budget cycle, regardless of projects in flight. The evolution of the district security footprint is constantly evolving to meet current threats. So again, um, kind of uh, a great way to cap off that con that question and we appreciate that question a lot. Um, the next is a comment um, from another attendee. No question, just appreciate Hearing all this information, very interesting. I had no idea about most of this. Thank you. Uh, thanks for attending today. I appreciate your time. And um, another individual had written in and asked if this slide presentation is available. Um, it is being recorded. Today's presentation, it will be posted on the district's uh, YouTube page and as well, we'll be posting it to our website, um, a link to the video for all of our Talk and Water series where this can be reviewed at anyone's uh, convenience. As of right now, that is the end of the available questions. So um, one last uh, call for anyone attending. Please, if you have any questions, if you want to hear any more information from our, our speakers and our experts, please write those uh, below. But as of right now, uh, this wraps up the Q&A for the moment.
Well, I would just say again on behalf of all the presenters and all of the uh, guests today that we appreciate your time and your effort to learn more about your rates. If you develop additional questions, feel free to call us. Our um, hotline rate, remain phone number 503-848-3000 or you can email us or a lot of information about rates is also on our website at tvwd.org slash rates and you can email or contact us and we would be happy to discuss any questions that you have beyond this event. This is Commissioner Dode and I really appreciate the energy that the staff has brought to this presentation and also the hard work they do to make us all safe and keep the rates down. If I could figure out how to make the clap on the on the uh, uh, screen, I would do that, but I'm at a loss for this. I'm uh, somewhat of a Zedite uh, when it comes to computers. So, but thank you very much. Really appreciate it. So I will uh, close this presentation and and just again thank you very much for your time. Uh, certainly welcome to to hear again if you it, you know if we'll be doing this again tonight uh, and again on August twenty first. Um, if you after you uh, have some time to digest this information, if you think of an additional question. Uh, either please feel free to reach out uh, through the the methods that Andrea set out uh, or attend another one and ask your question there. So thank you for your time today and uh, thank you commissioners for attending. Uh, much appreciated and uh, you will be hearing from all of us again. Thank you.